Here we have an iPad Mini 2 that was dropped in yesterday by a customer. And he said that while trying to replace the digitizer on the iPad, he messed up the digitizer FPC connector. Let's take a look. Right here. FPC connector for the digitizer is damaged and needs to be replaced. Without wasting too much time, let's go ahead and do it. Let's put this on the side. And what I'm going to do is also protect the battery connector. So we can either put a coin on there or some type of shield so it doesn't get exposed to heat like this one here. I just put a plate over the battery connector and the battery flex cable so we do not damage it. I do not want to fix one thing and then expose something else to heat that may possibly go bad. So. It only takes a second to put a shield over the connector, the battery connector, and now we can focus on this digitizer FPC connector. Now, how much heat should we apply in order to remove this connector? A lot of people tell you it depends on your hot air station. While that's true, most hot air stations are accurate as far as temperature goes. Uh, buying a cheap hot air station does not mean that the temperature is not accurate. If you are dialing to 400 degrees on your cheap hot air station, you may get 400 degrees. And I've tested this with the Xtronic machine. This is not an expensive machine, maybe $300 for an all-in-one machine. And when I tested the temperature coming out of the hot air nozzle here, it was given an accurate temperature. As I used this handle or the hot air station one month, two months, three months down the road, it started to lose accuracy. I have it set at 400 degrees and it's outputting 300 degrees. So I had to change the heating element inside. And I found myself changing the heating element maybe three, four times a year. I've had the uh, quick hot air station for almost uh, three years. I never changed the heating element, not even once. So this is what sets a good hot air station from a cheap one. How well the station can maintain the heating element. What type of heating element is being used? Airspeed is another thing. This one, had airspeed I think from 1 to 10 even at 10 it's not enough air coming out so if you do not have enough air coming out of the nozzle that's another problem let's take the Weller soldering station for example it's an $800 machine you can get a cheap Chinese soldering station for about $30 $40 so what sets it apart let's say I have 400 degrees set on the station I should be getting 400 degrees at the tip here as soon as you touch the tip on to the board the board is gonna absorb the heat What's going to happen is you're going to start to lose heat at the tip. So the heat is no longer 400 degrees. Let's say the board absorbed 150 degrees. Now you have 250 degrees left on the tip. That's not enough heat to melt unleaded solder. Or maybe you're going to find yourself having a hard time soldering or desoldering a component. What the machine will do, it will sense that the tip is losing heat and it's going to pump more heat onto the tip. So it keeps it at the temperature that I have set. If I have 400 degrees set on the machine, the tip is going to stay at 400 degrees. It doesn't matter if the board is absorbing the heat or not. That's an awesome technology because a lot of beginners, uh, when they are using cheap stations, they find themselves having a hard time desoldering a component or soldering a component or solder is not liquefying. And that's because the board is absorbing the heat and there's not enough heat on the tip. That's what sets a good uh, soldering station from a cheap one. The other thing is, if I want to change the tip on this soldering iron, done i took it off i put another tip so while working on a job uh, if i feel like the tip is too thin i take it out i switch it to a thicker tip and i work on it so having the right equipment can make all the difference i do not want to spend a lot of time comparing or doing any specific reviews let's proceed with the repair on the quick hot air station that i use maximum airspeed is 120 I'm going to probably put it down like 85 and temperature 400. Let's apply some flux. Turn on the fume extractor. Always. When the board reaches melting temperature, all those components reach melting temperature as well. So if you touch them by mistake, they're going to get knocked off the board. And good luck putting everything back together. I'm a little bit far away from the connector. 
I do not want to push this way or upwards. So I want to push the connector that way. To also be safe, cover the display FEC connector so we do not expose it to unwanted heat, just like that. I have a quarter here. Okay, and the connector is out. So what we're going to do is mix leaded solder with unleaded. Right now we have unleaded solder on the board and unleaded takes a lot of heat to melt. And we cannot solder a connector onto unleaded. The connector is going to burn before unleaded solder melts. So we're going to be using leaded solder and this is the standard when soldering. And as you can see, we still have a stock piece here. Let's get rid of the glare. We're going to turn our spotlight on. Just like this and the top light off let's go over this one more time just to make sure we have the solder all over the pads Okay, that should be good enough. Now let's grab our FPC connector. And for those of you who do this type of work, you can find those connectors on our website. They are sold in batches of five. And we use high quality ones, so they take a lot of heat as you will see now. We're gonna apply some flux. And this is the Amtec 559 flux that you can also buy off our website. Okay, so let's start. I have airspeed down to 63, so the connector doesn't fly away. I'm gonna apply heat from far and gradually go down. Temperature is 400 degrees. I'm gonna raise up airspeed because the connector made a good connection with the pads. Here we can see how solder liquefied from under the connector. Okay, and that's it. Perfect. Perfect.
We do not need to do anything else. I do not need to run over the pins. The connector flowed down very nicely on the pads. All we have to do is just clean up and test. Customer brought in a new digitizer that you see here, and he said if it doesn't work, we can use a digitizer from us. So let's, first thing we want to do is put the digitizer on the tablet here. Okay. Digitizer is in place. Let's connect our LCD and then we're gonna connect the battery and test. Okay, the screen is connected and let's connect our battery. And battery is connected. Assuming there is nothing else wrong with the tablet, the tablet should turn on. Customer brought it in, taken apart in pieces. And we never tried it in front of the customer, but I'm gonna assume what the customer told me is correct. So power it on. Yes, it powered on. Uh, the customer had doubts about the digitizer. If it doesn't work, we're gonna try our digitizer. Right now, two things can happen. His digitizer may not be good, or the job that we did is not good. And it's working. Seven. Nine, let's go back, turn it on. We have assistive touch on the tablet. It was there by default, I did not put it in. We do not even have the password to this tablet. I'm wearing gloves, so it's gonna be hard to move around the screen, but let's do it. And everything's perfect. Very nice. I'm gonna let Big Boss put this back and call the customer to come and pick up. And that's it, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, leave a comment if you have any questions and we'll do something else in the next video.